Good morning. Does Jesus heal our mental and emotional wounds? I'm Crystal Roy with the Kingdom Exchange, and I want to talk to you about a very exciting teaching that I've discovered as I've pursued asking the Lord to show me how he heals. Now, <clears throat> in my own background, I have um, been on healing teams and had great success with people being instantly healed, being healed over time. Um, my husband and I actually prayed for a woman whose finger was significantly shorter than the rest of her fingers. And during that pray prayer, within minutes, her finger was um, a normal length. Uh, the whole table saw it, you know, and it was um, a measurable healing. And <clears throat> in fact, uh, Justin Perry, who was my pastor long ago, called me a healing evangelist because of how the Lord has used me for physical healing, sending me into um, cardiac ICU where people were told basically uh, plan the funeral, he won't leave the floor um, tonight alive. But when we talk about the other wounds that aren't quite as visible, I began to ask the Lord, what does that look like? when you heal us emotionally and mentally. I've personally myself been healed emotionally and mentally a lot. <laughs> um, you know, there are certain things that you go through that um, you even forget about. But I wanna ask the question today, does God heal mental and emotional wounds? Now I know from personal experience, yes, and um, we want to talk about what the Bible says to us. Now, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and we do have the Holy Bible, but Jesus is the Word. So let's see what Jesus said about how he heals our mental and emotional wounds and how those show up in our lives so that we can be healed. <clears throat> First of all, we know from Isaiah, also Matthew and Hebrews, that Jesus bore our griefs and our sorrows. So when we do have the pain, the woundings that aren't physical, it's not like a broken arm, you can't see it, um, but Jesus bore our griefs and our sorrows. And he also bore our shame. So there's no reason to walk in shame over anything that's happened in your life. Even when you chose and did it yourself, no matter how dirty, bad, evil, wicked, mean, or nasty that is. Because when we surrender to Jesus, he can heal us everywhere we hurt. So let's look today about how and where in the Bible it shows us that, first of all, I believe healing is for today. Um, if, if someone doesn't believe healing is for today, God will not force that on you. But let's first talk about Paul and what Jesus finished. When Jesus said, it is finished, what was finished, that's super, super important. So Paul, who came along after Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, was operating out of what was finished, according to what the Lord was teaching him personally. <clears throat> So when we look at Acts 16, after the resurrection, I'm going to look at Acts 16, 16. Oops, did I write that down wrong? Let's see where I am. Give me one moment. And check me always. I'm open for correction. Okay. Where is it? I apologize. Okay, when we're talking about powers, principalities, and rulers of darkness, that Paul was speaking of. I'm sorry I can't put my finger on it. I, I wonder if there's a way to highlight this in the future. But anyway, 
we know that after Jesus was dead, was beaten, crucified, buried, resurrected, and who came back and told us, don't be afraid, I've got this. Forgive a man's sins and they are forgiven. Retain a man's sins and they are retained. He's telling us we have a choice about that and the consequences if we choose not to forgive a person. I was sure I looked this up correctly. But what Paul is saying from his perspective of having met Jesus face to face in Jesus' glory after the resurrection. That Jesus had finished what he had finished, Paul still states after the resurrection that we don't fight against flesh or we don't have carnal weapons. We fight against the principalities and rulers and the spirits in high places. That's what our new battle is all about. So how do we do that? How do we battle the spirits of our mind? How do we battle mental, emotional wounds? So we're going to look at the tools today to do that. And one of those is simply uh, surrender and obedience. But let's talk about it. So <clears throat> Jesus said, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me to preach, to heal, to set the captives free. So, Jesus came to bind up the brokenhearted. Also, he came to heal. Now, if I have a broken arm, you can see that. It's pretty easily discerned, and you might be more protective of me if I have a broken arm. And you could say, Crystal, hey, let me help you with that. If you see me struggling, let's say in the kitchen with a pot of boiling water, which could be like five or seven pounds depending upon the pot. A gallon of milk is five pounds. But if I have a mental or emotional wound, it might not be visible. Now some are visible in the form of depression, in the form of ADHD, in the form of CPTSD or PTSD. Those wounds are visible in our decisions and in outcomes but they may not be visible in my body and you may not know how to protect me if i'm having a mental or emotional wound but let's look at how this plays out i want to read uh, luke 4 18. <clears throat> this was actually where Jesus was reading the scroll and reading from the book of Isaiah because remember Luke had not been written yet, right? Unrolling it, Jesus found the place where it's written, The Spirit of the Lord is on me, because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Right? So when we look at this, he's saying, I'm filled with the anointing of God because he himself has anointed me. I haven't anointed myself. I'm not operating out of my own charisma or my own image control or, or even... Um, my appointment by somebody or even myself. I am operating according to the anointing that God, my Father, has anointed me with. Filled me with His power to do these things. To proclaim good news to the poor. What kind of news would be good for poor people? What about abundance? That would be good news to the poor. How about abundance for every good work, like the Word says? I shall supply your every need according to my riches in glory, right? Those by Christ Jesus. That's different from Jesus Christ. So whenever you're reading the Bible, notice, is it Christ Jesus or is it Jesus Christ? Because those make a difference. So just a note on that. Christ Jesus is first introducing his Godhead and then him as a man. So him operating 
in the Godhead as a man. And then Jesus Christ is the man who is God. And those can make a difference. So like, I have the mind of Jesus. No, 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 no. That's limited. That's limited to a man's mind. I have the mind of Christ, which means I have the mind to receive in the Spirit through my Holy Spirit into my mind to conceive the things of Almighty God. So when he turns my attention towards something, I have the mind of Christ to process that and receive it and then to act on it according to his will for that situation or circumstance. <clears throat> but Jesus is saying, he came, he sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners. What are we imprisoned by? Past mistakes? The past? Our wounds from the past? And recovery of sight for the blind? Now, this is practical. <coughs> Excuse me. As we see Jesus healed a blind man who was blind from birth. There's also spiritual blindness where there's a veil that the Bible and Isaiah talks about over nations where the whole nation is veiled by perhaps unbelief and certainly uh, the wages of sin, right, is death. To set the oppressed free. What does oppression look like? Okay, um, I've had an opportunity to live in a country <clears throat> outside the United States and fully operate there. I didn't have a job there. It was not possible in my line of work. Because of the um, division of male and female. <clears throat> Oppression, as I experienced, is being ruled from the outside. So I'm not going to do something, not because internally it's a part of my value system and I'm standing on the Word of God like the little kid's song says, but I am not going to do something because the penalty of the culture, the penalty of even the family culture, uh, that might even mean I'm not going to excel. Because the penalty of the family culture says when anybody starts to get to a level above me or us, <clears throat> then we're going to force them from the outside to stop their growth. We're going to force them from the outside to stop their success. We're going to force them or oppress them from the outside to give up the dreams that they have that's bigger than my dreams that they won't accomplish more than I accomplish. This is literally the definition of dysfunction. <clears throat> but Jesus came to set the oppressed free. So there's the oppression from the outside of what I do. And it starts with oppression from the outside with what I think. I want to just show you pierced ears. Okay. When I was 45 years old, I started to think, you know, I started to notice some beautiful earrings on women. I had not pierced my ears, ever. And I realized, wait a minute, <clears throat> the decision to not have pierced ears was not mine. It was from my growing up years. Because the thinking, the corrupt <clears throat> gospel was that if God had wanted you to have holes in your ears, he would have put them there. You can decide that after you're 18. Well, by the time I was 18, I had lived through such hell that pierced ears was not on my top priority list. Neither was even affording earrings, okay? Um, and things have become, in my opinion, much more affordable today. I have the Play-Doh rule. Like, back in the day when my kids were young, they wanted Play-Doh, and of course you guarded that because you wanted to dry up because you just possibly spent $20 on Play-Doh, and then in a day, it's gone. Now, if you can get Play-Doh at the dollar store, <clears throat> I don't care if it dries up, right? So, my, I have a Play-Doh rule of life. That's my that's my economic uh, scale. <laughs> Is Play-Doh still available in the dollar store? Then I think we're all going to be fine. Plus, I have lived in a third world country where there was an entire city of cardboard. <clears throat> it was next to a palace. 
you know, which speaks a lot about what was happening there. But having lived in a, a country with extremes, already with opulence, I mean, real extremes, that um, you know, to live in America as with simplicity is still wealth. It is still, I don't care. I mean, there are some families who are, you know, they, their, their homes aren't habitable, which means animals can get in and out easily. I grew up actually with a house like that. And, um, you know, so to have a whole house with no holes is wealth to me. Um, so simplicity is fine. But back to oppression, right? I had to learn hard and fast when I was a, a tiny girl four years old about the world and it didn't get any better. So back to my earrings, right? By the age of 18, I had lived such hell along with the others in the house <clears throat> that, you know, deciding about earrings was not on my top priority. So at 45 years old, I realized that I was living a decision that was not my own about pierced ears. All right. And I read the Bible that says, you know, you don't win people with the braiding of your hair or jewelry or whatever. But I also saw that that doesn't mean don't braid your hair, don't wear jewelry. It means that you don't win people to Christ by your image. You win it by your character. So I studied people for a year. Is she wearing earrings or not wearing earrings? Is the whole visible or not visible? Are most women with pierced ears wearing earrings all the time, or are there sometimes they don't wear earrings? So basically, I'm a processor, right? So when I got to the end of kind of my year of studying people, right, I decided I would like to have my ears pierced. So I pierced my ears at the age of 46 years old. Now, my late husband was shocked because, you know, he'd known me my whole adult life. We married at eight. I was 18 when we married. And... He had known me, you know, for a long time with no earrings. And he, he was funny. He said, don't you pierce anything else. <laughs> I guess he thought I would go crazy. Like get one tattoo and then have a sleeve. Uh, but that's the only thing I ever pierced. Just to my, TMI. But this is an example of other people's decisions and how they affect you. Because that decision I had carried with myself from the outside of something in a, from an environment that didn't even exist. So, Jesus came to set us free from external controls, mentally, like our decision-making processes, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor, which I proclaim every year, and I want you to do that too. This is the year of the Lord's favor. We're going into September, which is the um, civic uh, Jewish calendar, and then of course the new year, or in March, is is the religious or spiritual beginning of the year. Um, but we still honor the civic calendar. But then we have also our own calendar. Like I'm in the West, in the United States, we have January first is the beginning of the year, and we have fiscal calendars for business owners, and then we have uh, tax calendars, we have uh, seasonal calendars. And we have our birthdays. Like I have, a, I have a milestone birthday coming up. That is a new year for me. It is a new year to celebrate me on the earth and the Father God speaking his will through me on the earth for his will to be done on earth as it is in heaven. So I want to encourage you when, you're, when it's time for your birthday that you celebrate your partnership with Father speaking those things on earth that are not as though they are, and you declaring to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. I proclaim the year of the Lord's favor on my life for my family, for legacy and generations. Not that I'm self-important, um, but when God chose me to walk this path, he equipped me to do that. And then he, every day I say, what is our scroll? For today, what is our scroll for this moment? What is my assignment for today? Bring forth the encounters that you would like for me to have and help me have a good attitude about it if it's hard, right? So I can release your love on the earth. So Jesus came to set us free from wrong thinking and other people's rules and other people's 
expectation. So the expectation was, as a good Christian girl, I would not have pierced ears. But did I violate anything of the kingdom by piercing my ears? Absolutely not. So let's continue on. That's what Jesus came to do. <clears throat> so let's talk about how Jesus heals us mentally, emotionally, spiritually. I want to start with the woman at the well. Okay? I'm hot, so I have to move my hair around a bit. The woman at the well story can be found in John 4. Okay, and we basically know the story, right? She came to the well to get water while Jesus was there. And while he was there, let's see how he healed her broken heart and changed her life. This is uh, John 4, and it's um, 1 through 42. Now Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard that he was gaining and baptizing more disciples than John. Although, in fact, it was not Jesus who baptized, but his disciples. So he left Judea and went back once more to Galilee. Now he had to go through Samaria, so he came to a town in Samaria called Sychar, and forgive the pronunciations. I would have to see it in the original language that I don't pronounce it. Near the plot of ground Jacob had given his son Joseph. So this is established holy ground. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well. It was about noon. I mean, that's 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 a hard travel time, even when we have air conditioning in our car. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, Will you give me a drink? Now this has lots of implications if you understand the background of these people groups. His disciples had gone into town to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, You are a Jew, and I am a Samaritan woman. Like, we don't even talk to each other. How are you asking me for something? Um, how can you ask me for a drink? For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. So basically, it didn't say Samaritans don't associate with Jews. It said Jews who consider themselves higher and better don't associate with Samaritans. You have some of that in your life, and I know you're thinking of an example right now. Let's continue to hear what Jesus said. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. So she didn't know what she was in the presence of. Sir, the woman said, you have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us this well and drank from it himself, and also did his sons and his livestock? So she's still thinking in the natural. Jesus answered, Everyone who drinks this water in this well will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I don't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water. She's still thinking of the practical natural. He told her, Go, call your husband and come back. I have no husband, she replied. Jesus said to her, You're right when you say you have no husband. The fact is, you've had five husbands and the man you now have is not your husband. What you have... What you've just said is quite true. Sir, the woman said, I can see that you are a prophet. <laughs> You're reading my mail. <clears throat> Our ancestors worshipped on this mountain. But you Jews claim that the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. Woman, he replied, believe me, a time is coming. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> when you will worship the Father, neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know, for salvation is from the Jews. Yet a time is coming and is now come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in the Spirit and in truth. For they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God is Spirit, and His worshipers must worship in the Spirit and in truth. The woman said, I know that Messiah. She called Him Christ. She said, I know that Messiah is coming. 
When he comes, he will explain everything to us. Then Jesus declared, I, the one speaking to you, I am he. So she was looking for Jesus. And he was, in fact, right in front of her, but she did not recognize him. But he said, I am the one you seek, the one you're waiting for. <clears throat> so now the disciples rejoined Jesus. Just then the disciples returned and were surprised to find him talking with a woman. Highly inappropriate, right? They're alone. They're isolated. She's gone to the well. It's noon. No one else is there. But no one asks, what do you want or why are you talking with her? Nobody asks that. Then, leaving her water jar, the woman went back to town and said to the people, Come, see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Messiah? They came out of town and made their way toward him. Meanwhile, the disciples urged him, Rabbi, eat something. Right? He's saying, basically, My food is from my father. All right, so coming down to many of the Samaritans, from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony he told me everything i ever did let's stop here <clears throat> when jesus when love comes to you for the purpose of healing you and tells you everything you ever did when love tells you everything you ever did he is reframing that. He is resetting you. He's bringing you out of oppression. He's bringing you out of pain. And he is bringing you into freedom and into hope. So while when we are healing physical wounds, whether it's a heart condition that you can't see from the outside, or a pinky that grows to normal length to match the other pinky and the rest of the fingers, or if it is um, a ruptured disc in a back that's healed instantly, <clears throat> if it's a heart situation, if it's multiple system effects from a drug overdose that's healed instantly, it's all through the power of love. But the mental wounds where, imagine this lady has had five husbands, and the one she's with now is not her husband. Maybe he's decided he's just going to use her and not marry her. Maybe she's decided, I've done this so many times, I'm just going to not do the legal thing. I'm just going to do what I want. doesn't matter anyway. But if she's had five husbands, she potentially had five divorces. But she also could have had been widowed several times. She's had extreme severe emotional tearing of herself into microscopic, horribly torn pieces <clears throat> emotionally with each and every one of these marriages that ended. Whether it ended in widowhood or it ended in divorce, that is so destructive because what you used to be as one You're now torn, shredded. You could be shredded by betrayal. You could have been the one to betray first before you get betrayed. <coughs> but all of these things she had endured in her life, she said that he told her everything she had ever done. And we don't see it in this passage. But we see her exclamation. Love told me everything I've ever done. And when love comes to confront you and your perspective on the things that have happened in your life, it brings with it healing. You can hash this over for the, you know, the next 40 years of your life. But when love comes and confronts you, love will change the framework of your experience. So what we see is a woman who encountered Christ, 
was looking for him but didn't see him, he had to identify himself. But when Jesus' love told her the new narrative of her life within the context of who he was, she was mentally, emotionally, and spiritually healed to the point she went and told everybody, come meet the man who told me everything I've ever done. And because of that, it says that many of the Samaritans from that town believed in Jesus because of the woman's testimony. And again, he told me everything I ever did. So when the Samaritans came to him, they urged him to stay with them, and he stayed two days. And because of his words, many more became believers. And when Jesus does come into our life and reset the narrative with love, we are healed. And not only are we healed, we are able to take that healing to other people and release the truth of Jesus. Now imagine, this woman was very influential. She got a whole town to come turn out to see somebody. But she was claiming to be the Christ. <clears throat> they certainly knew her. You don't live in a small town and everybody not know your business. And I know I come from a small town. Everybody, and if they don't know your business, they'll make stuff up. But these people had seen her at the bazaar shopping at the well they had seen her whole life you know they uh, they certainly knew who she was and she had influence because of that she was certainly influential i'm sure that moms told little girls hey don't be like so and so i'm sure husbands said to wives uh yeah don't do that because you might get divorced like miss so and so and then we've got people who said oh my gosh i can see I can see how she has changed in just one encounter with love that she's been seeking for her whole life through a series of men. But I have to go see this one that she calls the Messiah. And because love spoke to her in her deepest area of pain, multiple marriages, and he gave her his perspective on that, I don't reject you. I don't see you as shameful. I'm not going to marginalize you or set you aside because of your divorces, your multiple divorces, and now in fact you're living in sin. But I'm going to love you and tell you who you are. And he told her, I believe not only everything she ever did, but why she did it. And with that revelation of love, that covered her multitude of sin. She was changed so much that she brought the whole city out to see love. So I know that we all have been through things in life that have hurt us emotionally. When you allow Jesus to step in to your life and to tell you from his point of view of love, everything you've ever done, it will change you. It will free you. And then you, in turn, go tell everybody else about the truth and the love that you have encountered. The forgiveness, the love that covers your multitude of sin, five marriages and the one you're living with now you aren't even married to. And then, she had a choice. She was confronted with, I'm living in sin. <gasps> because once Jesus enters your life and you are in sin and you know that you want to not ever do anything to hurt Jesus, you have to come face to face with what happens now. Maybe she proposed to him. Maybe she had a sit down talk and said, you know, what is the future of this relationship? Because we must make it honorable to the Lord. And the man could decide, well, I'm going to ask you to marry me, right? And the man could say, I'm out of here. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not into that. <coughs> so once love <clears throat> steps into our lives and tells us who we are, and perhaps tells us why we did the thing we did for the purpose of bringing healing, 
then we have a choice. We have to step out and then say, I need to make my life line up with the truth of what I believe. It will not be easy. Uh, marriages are not easy. They are quite hard. Goodness, I'm sorry. I'm just all over the place today. And then widowhood is not easy. It's quite hard. Divorces are quite hard. But living in sin has a cost. And that cost is death. So let's ask Jesus, what do I do with this healed person in this situation? And he will tell you. He will tell you, go and sin no more. That may be our next talk. But today I want you to invite Jesus into your life to tell you from love your story. So if you were to tell your story, you're going to be up here, blah, blah, blah. She hurt me. He hurt me. They don't, the kids don't listen. But then drop down into your spirit and say, Jesus, what do you see in my story? And you let him deal with it. Will you let Jesus tell you everything you ever did instead of letting Satan tell you all the time. Not only what you ever did, but what you never did. So I want to bless you today with the presence of the Lord. I want you to be mindful that he, there is a water that when you drink from that well, you will always be satisfied. And when love tells you the narrative of your life, it brings healing, it brings restoration, and it is noticeable to everybody around you. It brings reconciliation. It brings love. Don't let the enemy tell you the narrative of your life. We have been commanded to have the mind of Christ. I want to challenge you today. Anytime that you get off of thinking from a position of Jesus in you, Holy Spirit in you, Christ in you, the hope of glory, now, Jesus says a man is not in you. It says Christ in you. So the God part of Jesus, Christ Jesus, is in you. So, Jesus, what do you see? Jesus, what do you see about this frustrated woman who's screaming at her children? Jesus, what do you see about this man who's having a temper tantrum in the store? How can I bring love to this situation? How can I bring love to me? And then when my life is so changed, everyone around me, will say, I've got, to, I've got to meet this Jesus who's changed your life. And when the enemy tries to tell you the narrative of your life, you say, no, that is not the mind of Christ. So let me bless you today. The Lord bless you and keep you, make his face shine upon you, be gracious to you and give you peace. May you always sense his Holy Spirit within you and will to do his will. And today, let's endeavor to let the narrative be written by love and not the enemy. God bless you guys.